This is Kelsey McMurtry, and welcome to the Empowered Podcast, episode 24. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Empowered Podcast. I'm your host, Ellery Wells, and I am so glad that you're here with me today. You know, the Empowered Podcast is designed to help you and me. You know, we sit here and we listen to these guests, and after each episode, I want us both to have the ability to develop into the people that we want to be, overcome the challenges that we are facing, and really focus on personal development and grow to the abilities or grow into the abilities that we need in order to succeed, and succeed by our definition. I'm so excited to be here with you today. In just a couple hours, I'm about to head up to Dallas, Texas. Now, you're going to hear this, and when you hear this, it will at least be yesterday. Today's Tuesday. I usually publish these things on Wednesday, but today, Tuesday, I'm going to go hear my friend James Kenson talk about getting podcast guests. He'll be speaking at an event up in the Addison area, and I would highly recommend you uh, you check out the episode with James. I just did one. I'll have him on the show again uh, in the future, but if you go to empoweredpodcast.com slash EP23 as Empowered Podcast 23, you can hear how his life has just been changed over the last seven months of him starting that podcast and i'm really excited to go hear him talk just a teaser for that um he might be on tv in one of the largest markets in the united states which is pretty amazing and it all came about by starting a blog and doing a podcast you'll hear what his topic is and uh, i highly highly encourage you to uh, to check that out empoweredpodcast.com slash ep23 in today's episode, I have a conversation with a with a friend, Mark Mason. Mark also lives in the Dallas area. I had the chance to meet him in person at the Platform Conference in November of 2013, and he has really just increased the amount of knowledge that he has between his ears about marketing, about doing business online, and honestly becoming an entrepreneur in the margins or in the spare time that you and I might just toss aside waiting in line or on the weekends or late at night. His podcast is the Late Night Internet Marketing Podcast, and that's how I discovered him the first time. And, you know, I was having a conversation with somebody just this past weekend about time management, and I'm coaching somebody about time about time management. And you know, we, we all have 24 hours in a day. No one has any more. No one has any less. Some of us may live longer than other people, but we all have 24 hours in the day. And you can't argue with the fact that some, of, some people are more successful than others. And yeah, you can argue the definition of success and all of these things, and we can get into this big philosophical debate. But anyone who says, I'm not as successful as I want to be, all you have to do is look at people who are making the best use of those 24 hours in a day. So without further delay, we'll go right into the interview with Mark Mason. We'll stick around at the end. I'll give you a teaser for what's coming up on the next episode and share a few personal thoughts. Here we go. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Empowered Podcast. I'm here with Mark Mason, who's the brain behind the Late Night Internet Marketing Podcast and blog. How are you doing today, Mark? I'm the brain, huh? Because sometimes I think of <laughs> sometimes I think of myself as the muscle, but okay, I'll take brain. That works brain works good. The brains and the muscle behind the Late Night Internet Marketing <laughs> Podcast. Well, Mark has he's got a full-time day job that he really enjoys and he does, he has built uh, his audience for the late night internet marketing uh, brand completely after hours he's got you know like I said the full-time job the family and the kids and I'm excited to talk with him about how he's built his brand and his audience completely on the side and and has become someone who is in masterminds with I won't tell you who they are but some of the the leaders in this kind of internet business, um, this industry, this podcasting industry, and how he's gone from creating it on day one to where he is now. So without further delay, Mark, would you give us a little bit of back, uh, a background of what you're up to now and maybe how you got to where you are? Sure. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, yeah, I uh, have a day job at a Fortune 500 company. 
Um, it's a very large electronics company in the, in, in Texas. And, um, my role there is kind of a director level position. And back in 2007, um, I got a phone call from my wife. We'd been toying around with creating a side business. We kind of had the entrepreneurial bug, but wasn't sure what we were going to do exactly. And she she said, you've got to, you've got to watch this segment on the Today Show. So I logged on to the network website and I was able to stream the segment of the Today Show where it was explaining that this retired home handyman had written down everything he ever knew about fixing locks and bathtubs and faucets and toilets and doors and hinges in a website and had monetized that website with AdSense and was making $11,000 a month. And, and I couldn't, it's pretty good for a handyman. I couldn't, be, I couldn't believe it. He was a retired guy just sitting in his living room, uh, in his pajamas making $11,000 a month. And I thought, okay, there's something to this. And so I started researching, uh, how to do that myself. And at that time the brand was masonworld.com because that was a domain that I had from, uh, from back, uh, you know, in the nineties. And I kept that domain for a while, but now the brand has turned into late night internet marketing, which is all about how to build internet businesses in your spare time at night. Now, how did you gain the knowledge to be able to do this? Do you do marketing or did you do marketing before or yeah. what, what led you to this? No, I'm an engineer and a, a turbo geek. So my only, <laughs> my only advantage in this space is that I, I was a computer geek. So building websites and, and doing technical stuff on the internet wasn't that big a deal for me, but the marketing piece of it and, and learning how money moves around on the internet, I learned it the hard way. I bought courses, I read blogs, I interacted with, um, people that, you know, were teaching this stuff online and, uh, you know, like a lot of other people, I just decided I was going to learn about it. And there was, a ton of free and paid information out on the internet that I could take advantage of. And so I did that. And over the course of a year or two, I got, uh, uh, you know, all the information that I needed. Most of it, um, most of these things, when you're wanting to learn something, if you're really interested, most of it is just a matter of actually doing the work to, to get the information and, uh, you know, stick to itiveness. Yeah. I just, uh... Someone who I interviewed just this morning we talked about uh, is actually Todd Tremonti, who does real estate there in the Dallas area. Also, he was talking about persistence and consistency and how those are two of the biggest factors in getting anywhere, just like you said, st sticking to it. Yeah, one of the tricks that I tell people all the time about working on, you know, there's, there's it's difficult sometimes to build a business on the side because especially if you have a, a, a demanding day job and a family, the, the side business oftentimes is the third or fourth priority, major priority in your life. And so a simple life hack that you can use to push this thing through and to be consistent and persistent, as, as that guy says, is just to do a little something, no matter how small, on your business every day. That's one of the tips that I I give to people because some, some days it'll be a huge, big thing. You might work a couple of hours. Some days it might be five or 10 minutes, but as long as you do something every day, your business will stay top of mind and you'll, you'll make a little bit of progress every day, which added up over weeks and months and years can build into something that's really valuable. What are something that you do every day? Is it the same thing or is it different every day? Now, what I recommend to people is that you know, of course, you have some goals for your business and you break those down into into projects and tasks and so forth. And that before you go to bed each night, you think about, OK, what do I want to try to accomplish tomorrow? And and you don't make it too huge. Right. You something that's accomplishable, just one thing. So and it's going to be different every day. It's going to depend on what you work on. But maybe it's that blog post that you need to write or maybe Maybe even that's too big. Maybe it's the blog post you need to decide on the topic for or the title of or do the research for, but just something that you can have on your list for the next day that no matter what, you're going to get that one thing done. Is there something that you specifically do? Well, you know, it, it for me, um, as big as a business is now, 
it it's varies all over the place. So usually it has something to do with content creation. The you know the mm-hmm. key of key to my business is keeping the podcasts and the videos and all the stuff flowing. So usually the the one thing that I want to do tomorrow has something to do with with podcasting. Um, and today my one thing is I you know I've I've currently I think my current episode is episode uh, sixty seven of my podcast and I'm already starting to work on episode 70, which is a couple episodes in advance. And I need to decide on and do a little research on the main topic for that episode. So that's my one thing for today. Now I'll do much more than that today. I usually do, but that's the one thing I'll do for sure. Awesome. Uh, you had mentioned doing videos uh, just a minute ago. I, I think most of your videos that I've seen, maybe not all of them that are actually out there, but most of the ones that I've seen have you behind the wheel of a car driving down the highway up there in the DFW Metroplex? What, why, why do you do that? Well, my brand's a little quirky, right? I mean, I, one of the reasons I do it, quite frankly, is because it causes people to talk about it. And, you know, I get a lot of really positive feedback on those videos. But that started off because I live about 20 miles from my job, and and it's on a major highway with a lot of traffic. And so I try to use the time in my car for my business. And at first that meant, um, listening to podcasts and learning about internet business. And eventually I started dictating blog posts and content. Um, and I had a transcriptionist who would take that content and transcribe it into blog posts and so forth for me and and put it on my blog. And I still do that. And now, in addition to that, I've started this series of videos where I'm actually I put I have a little thing that I that holds the camera up on the windshield where I'm looking anyway, and I instead of talking to the person in the seat next to me, which I might normally do when I'm driving, I talk to the camera uh, on particular topics, and that's worked out pretty well. I get some interesting feedback on those. And no wrecks or accidents yet. Yeah, actually, <laughs> I find it le- I find it less distracting than actually talking to a person in the passenger seat, which you would okay. normally do because I'm looking out the windshield at the traffic like I normally would. The camera is in front of me. And uh, I, actually, I use my iPhone for this, which has an excellent uh, video capability. And, uh, you know, I, I find it safer than, than talking to someone or, you know, looking down and changing the radio station, et cetera. So, Mark, what, what is, are the next steps for you with the late night internet marketing brand? Well, you know, um, my big goal for 2014, and this is one of the, the things I always recommend to people is make sure that you know what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And like a lot of people that a lot of times what makes sense is to have annual goal setting processes. And so I have an annual goal setting process that I go through and my goals most, mostly for 2014 are to grow the brand. So I have a lot of goals around increased listenership for the podcast, increased readership for the blog, increased content production, which is a key to that, um, and stuff like that. So the next steps for me for 2014 are uh, you know, increased exposure and growth of the brand. Now, I... I'm I'm pretty bad at at marketing. I don't do a whole lot of graphics. The header on my site and my podcast logo were done by a friend of mine. And what what tips would you have for someone like me who doesn't really know a whole lot about marketing and or what we have done has just kind of been uh, I'll call some of my stuff weak. I, I put a lot of effort into it, but. It's nothing like what you have or what my friend's been able to do for me. What type, what kind of tips do you have for us who aren't the creative types? Well, specifically for graphics, I mean, I think, you know, in business in general, the, the broad tip is whenever you run up at something that either you – whenever you run up against something that you either don't like to do or you're not good at doing, that's a prime candidate for something to outsource. And in the case of graphics, graphics work can be outsourced at a range of pricing levels. So if you're just getting started, a lot of times you can go to a place like Fiverr.com, F-I-V-E-R-R.com, and get some pretty good graphics for 5 or $10 for whatever it is that you want. 
Or if you've got a little money to just a little more money to spend, you can go to a place like Odesk and get good graphics, depending on what it is that you need for twenty five or fifty or a hundred dollars, depending on the complexity of, of what you want. Or if you're really going for the home run ball, you can go to a place like 99 Designs and get your graphics done for three or four or five or six hundred dollars, um, depending on where you are with your business. Obviously, if you're just getting started, spending six hundred dollars on a website header makes absolutely no sense. You want a five dollar website header that looks great, and so you know you you price accordingly. But outsourcing stuff that you're not good at—that's a key. Um, a key concept that solo entrepreneurs need to embrace. And oftentimes they're reluctant because they feel like, well, part of being a solo entrepreneur means I have to do everything. And the truth of the matter is yeah. that's exactly the wrong idea. You should be, you should be the strategy behind the business. You should do the things that you're really good at and that you love to do, but you should you should find other people a little bit at a time to do the stuff that you don't want to do or the stuff that you don't do well. So being a solopreneur doesn't mean you have to do everything yourself. Absolutely right. My other favorite example, it, my other favorite example is accounting. I mean, I'm an engineer. I'm not good at accounting. I hate it, even though I know a ton of math. It's not the math that that I that bothers me. It's the you know the tax related tax law stuff. I have no interest in doing that. I don't do my own books. I have somebody else do that, and it's incredibly inexpensive. So when you started the the internet marketing podcast, what did you start it and the blog at the same time, or did it come later? That's a great question. No, actually, um, I started the blog and okay. got some success with the blog, but I was listening to podcasts and um, you know particularly the Internet Business Mastery podcast um, over. At, with Jason and Jeremy over at uh, internetbusinessmastery.com. And I was a big fan of their stuff. And I thought, well, hey, wait a minute. You know, I, I'm to the point where I've got plenty to say and I, and I felt comfortable in that medium. And so I got interested in starting a podcast. And that's how I uh, came across Cliff Ravenscraft and, and got started on my own podcast journey. What would you say you've gotten out of doing a podcast? You've been doing it for, or actually, one, two questions. How long have you been doing it, and what have you gotten out of it? Well, on and off, I've been podcasting since 2009. I have 67 episodes out there. I really enjoy it. It's very effective, uh, and my goal for 2014, one of my big goals is to increase the regularity with which I podcast. So I'm hoping to do 50 episodes in 2014, which would be almost double the amount of episodes I've done since 2009. So this is, you know, really taking the whole thing to the next level. There's two things I've gotten out of it. I think most podcasters will tell you they get a lot of um, exposure to people. So, you know, traffic to the blog and so forth. Um, but the thing that I value that I've gotten out of it is the relationship. There's some relationships that you, you are able to build with individual listeners is, is different uh, for a podcast than any other medium I've ever come across. And it's, uh, you know, really a special part of podcasting. And it's one of the things that, uh, makes podcasting worth doing for me. You know, you build a business for lots of reasons. Sometimes you build it because you need to make money. Sometimes you build it because you're passionate about the topic. Sometimes you build it for other reasons. And one of the other reasons for me is always, the relationships and interaction with listeners and people and readers and the ability to help people and stuff like that. And podcasting is uniquely suited to deliver on that particular uh, area. Yeah, with the ability to uh, you know, record voicemails directly from your computer like you have on your site. Or if you're listening to this one, go to empoweringthe80percent.com slash voicemail. You can leave me one. You know, but the, able, the ability to you know, pull in an MP3 directly from a, a audio file like that, play it back on the show and answer the questions live uh, or, or later rather. Uh, it is pretty cool. I, I've really enjoyed getting to talk to a lot of people because I found, you know, not a lot of people want to write, but if I asked you to guest post from my blog, I don't know what you would say, but having, you know, having a chat with me on a podcast 
it, it's easier for me to ask it. And I've gotten a lot of really positive feedback um, just by sitting down and having a conversation over the internet with somebody. Yeah, I'd say podcasting is the best kept secret in social media marketing still, even after all this time. You know, I think people are starting to get the idea and the the number of podcasts is increasing. But still, Mm -hmm. when you compare the number of podcasts to the number of blogs out there, there's just Mm -hmm. no comparison, right? I mean, there's just it's it's a tiny number. So the field of podcasting is wide open. And it's from my perspective, as you say, it's very high leverage. I mean, it's an intimate relationship, much more intimate than reading because it's your voice usually actually physically inside someone's ear, you know, in a pair of earbuds while they're doing something like working out or walking or driving. And, you know, that's just a very, that relationship just of you being in their ear is something that occurs at a different level than if someone's reading a blog post. Yeah. And I think right now, maybe it's just the people I've surrounded myself with, but it seems like there is a storm brewing of, of people wanting to do podcasts or starting to do interviews for their podcasts. It seems like it really is. And again, it may just be the people I'm hanging out with, but like, it's just about to really explode. Yeah. It's hard for me to tell exactly what's going on. I agree with you. Um, and I've seen, you know, this happen in the past and it, and, you know, and I don't know when it was probably 2007, when it looked like podcasting was really going to take off and it did get to a next level and then it plateaued. And even some very famous people were thinking that that plateau meant podcasting was dead. I think what's going to happen though, is as you say, this thing is starting to pick up and what's about to happen is podcasts are about to become available in automobiles. So in the infotainment industry, um, the the center consoles in cars are going to be internet connected in the next several years and things like stitcher radio will replace or at the very least be alongside things like satellite radio and so as soon as your podcast is available in every ford explorer that's on the road that's going to change the game. I mean, that's going to change the game by hundreds of millions of potential listeners. People who don't understand what an RSS feed are, don't have an iPod, don't know how to hook up to the internet. Those people, those mom and pops out there, they're going to be able to punch your show up on the center console in their car, and that's going to change everything. And I, I bet you would agree that our shows are a lot more are a lot less expensive than satellite radio. Yeah, you know, I don't for a listener anyway. Yeah, I don't know what the business model is going to be for getting the bandwidth to the car, right? But um, I can imagine that you know, if you need an LTE connection to your automobile, it's certainly not going to be more expensive than satellite radio. I mean, I pay a lot for satellite radio, particularly given what I get out of it. And so, you know, I think that it's pretty clear that. Um, at least in my opinion, that the days for that kind of technology are somewhat numbered and that it's going to be displaced by internet radio. Well, yeah, just, I, and I haven't been into to podcasts all that long, just, so it's December 2013. I guess I really listened to my first podcast maybe six months ago, and now I've got a dozen, you know, that are, are regular, but, you know, they're all free. I get to pick and choose not only the show, but the episode of the show and find content that I want to listen to at that moment or to help me grow my blog or my business or something. And you don't even have that ability with satellite radio. So I I probably agree with, agree with what you just said. Yeah. I mean that, that is the great appeal. So, you know, with satellite radio, I'm it's the live show satellite radio is live. So I'm stuck with whatever's on and there's only 200 channels or so on satellite radio. Well, Gosh, on iTunes, not including iTunes Radio, which has an infinite number of channels essentially because you can pick the music you want to listen to. If you set iTunes Radio aside, the number of podcast channels out there with informational content, there's like 
two hundred thousand podcasts on iTunes, or maybe or maybe more. I can't even remember now what the what the number is, but it's it's tons. Okay, way more than anything that something like satellite radio would be able to provide. So if you want to, if you're a, a you know an Ohio State football fan and you want to listen to an Ohio State football fan podcast, you can do that. You want news, you want that same thing on satellite radio, you'd have to get lucky to happen to catch an Ohio State fan show that's on once a day or maybe once a week, you know, so it's just a totally different model. And Mark, we, we've talked a few times over the last couple months and, you know, we met each other in person um, at the platform conference and everybody who hasn't listened to that episode, I can't remember which one I talked about it, but the power of going to these conferences again that's where i met mark mark what was the what does the word empower mean to you that's my brand empowering 80 percent the empowered podcast what does the word empower mean to you you know that's a it's very interesting that you ask me that question because i love that name for your podcast and i love the branding of em- Thank you. of empowerment you know i've been a manager of people um in a fortune 500 company for yeah, I've worked here for over 20 years. I haven't been a manager that whole time, but for most of the time, for maybe 15 of the 20 years, I managed people. And so empowerment's a very important concept to to me um, on on a lot of levels. And I think, you know, the, the biggest piece of empowerment for me is allowing people freedom to exercise responsibility. That's usually how I define empowerment is freedom to exercise responsibility to some purpose. So the freedom to get things done, the freedom to solve a customer problem, the freedom to create their own ideas or to to realize their own ideas and drive them to fruition, you know, and, and so empowerment in the business sense usually means people have the freedom to solve problems or to do work without having a lot of oversight. Empowerment on the internet side means to me that people have the freedom to grow their business, to get their ideas out there, to to get themselves to the next level um, without having to ask permission, right? I mean, you're you're empowered um, to to do the thing that you dream about doing just by virtue of the of the fact that you live in a world where these things are possible and uh, it's it's an important word in our language and it's a great word to be in the title of a podcast that's for sure yeah i like what you said to to exercise the responsibility toward toward a purpose i was talking to a manager last night and he he also works for a fairly large company and he manages a team and they do about, I don't know, $200 million a year in revenue. It's a big company. And he said, you know, they trust me to do a $200 million a year business, but I have to get executive approval to fix a $600 pro- uh, problem. And that doesn't, to me, sound all that empowering. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the particular situations, but um, you're absolutely right. If, you know, a lot of times the things that that run contrary to uh, empowerment are things that sneak up on you. And in this case, it's almost certainly unnecessary or overly restrictive financial controls, you know, that are placed on the business. In this case, you know, in the case that you're mentioning, the kind of empowerment you want is you want to empower people to spend money to solve problems but to have the responsibility that they need to treat it like it was their own money. And so that's why I always say empowerment comes with responsibility. We, we can empower somebody and give them an open checkbook, but with that open checkbook comes the responsibility to use that empowerment in a way that is consistent with you know, whatever makes sense for the shareholders or you know, whoever the governing body is that you got to worry about. And so that's why empowerment and responsibility always have to go hand in hand. It's not empowerment is is not something you're entitled to. It's it's a privilege that if 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 it's afforded to you is almost always beneficial to the person who gave it to you. That's kind of the, the kind of the magic about it. If you're a manager 
and you empower your people and you do it well and you instill that sense of responsibility, you've given the employee something, but it's to your benefit. In what ways do you empower the people around you? Yeah, so um, there's all kinds of different ways, but you know, typically um, we well, the way I like to operate is with my employees typically is if you're not sure what to do, ask me. If you're sure what to do, go ahead and do it and let me know what you did. And, you know, part of empowerment is under what circumstances are they empowered to make the decision. But um, typically what you're trying to do with empowerment from a management standpoint is push the boundary back. So maybe with an employee, you would start and you'd say, okay, these sorts of decisions you can make on your own. Just let me know what you decide and how it worked out. And then after they're successful with that, you can grow that boundary and say, okay, well now, you know, you've demonstrated you're able to do that. Well, let's give you some more authority. And eventually as a manager, the best managers, what you'll find is they empower their people to the point where they're not really needed anymore. The manager's not really making the decisions. The employees are the ones that are making good decisions and running the operation. And the manager becomes, you know, quite frankly, replaceable, redundant, you know, or he can go off and work on, or she can go off and work on strategic initiatives that that are, you know, focused on growing the company or whatever. And he's not worried about running the day-to-day operation because he's empowered his people with the caveat, you know, there's a difference between delegation and abdication, right? So you empower people by delegating authority generally and giving them the tools that they need to make good decisions. That's important, right? You've got to support that delegation with the right kind of stuff to make sure that um, that your employees are successful. Because as a manager, the success of your employees has to be one of your primary goals. So you got to make sure that they're empowered and that they have the stuff they need to be successful with that empowerment. Once you do that, then you'll, you'll see that the employees will grow. And probably the best thing that you could ever have happen is have an employee grow to the point where they can take your job. That frees you to go off and do something else that's more valuable for the company. And hopefully in the meantime, your manager has been empowering you to do things and you have more responsibility and you know, everybody wins in that case. Yeah. I went to a uh, entree leadership one day that Dave Ramsey did here in Austin. And one of the, one of the segments he talked about something very, uh, fairly similar to what you just said. He said, you know, the first time you show your employee or your teammate how to do it, the second time you help them do it, the third time you kind of say what was the result you know there's actually four or five steps and but those are the big three sure. you you show them then you help them and then you if you've done your job and train them you say what's what's the result uh, mark how do you unwind and relax well i play with my kids so <laughs> you got some teenagers i got right? teenagers i've got a three-year-old a seven-year-old a f- okay a 14 year old and a 16 year old so we have the whole uh, span. So, um, entertainment with the kids is great. And I spend time with my wife. One of our favorite things to do is, um, we have a, I guess down in Al- down in, uh, Austin, you have the Alamo theater. We have, uh, something kind of like that. Uh, but even maybe a notch fancier up here called I pick theaters. And it's one of these theaters where you, it's a big reclining leather chair with uh, with food service and wait staff that comes to you during the meeting and brings you food and all this kind of stuff. So a lot of times we'll go watch movies and do stuff like that. But we do something, my wife and I do something every other Saturday night. We have a standing uh, arrangement with a babysitter and every two weeks she and I go out and it's our time to go, you know, go play with friends or go and do our own thing or whatever. And so that's, that's kind of fun. The other thing that I do, um, that my listeners hear about from time to time is I play softball with a bunch of guys from my church and some seasons were really great and some seasons were awful. And (laughs) this year we, we, uh, this last season, we, we made it to the playoffs in the prior season. So this season we played up a bracket into a, a higher division and we were awful. So <laughs> I think we'll play back down. But uh, those are two things that I like to do to unwind. Very cool. What was the last movie that you guys saw or that you saw specifically? 
Gosh, so that's a great question. So uh, the last thing I saw was uh, the the uh, best man's wedding or what uh, best uh, you know best man's wedding, whatever the uh, the the movie. I'm trying to think of who's in that with. Uh, I've seen the previews that the guy from Lost. Yes, yes, yes. So and it's, it's fan- Tay Diggs. Yes, and- Tay Diggs is awesome. So that that movie was way, way, way better than I expected. That was a really good movie. Um, I'm at a little bit of disadvantage because my wife is very close with our nephews, and they were in from college, nephews and nieces, and they went to see Catching Fire, and somehow I got the opportunity to babysit. So I haven't, <laughs> so I, haven't. you definitely got the short end of that stick. Cause that movie's awesome. You got to see yeah, it. So I haven't seen that yet. And of course I've got to see the Hobbit. So those are the two, the two next movies that I'm going to see. There's a lot of good stuff coming out over Christmas. what do you think of the first Hobbit movie? Well, I, I really liked it. I was uh, surprised that they chose that uh, Peter Jackson chose to stretch that out into three movies that seems like yeah. a lot to me and and a little bit seems like a little bit of a money grab to me. Yeah. But yeah. I'm reserving judgment until I see the other two movies. I mean, I really enjoyed uh the movie, but I thought, you know, it it, it they didn't get nearly as far along as I thought they would in the first movie. Yeah, I kind of thought it was a little cheesy. Yeah, I think that's because he's drawing it out so long. He's going into I think a lot of detail that's not necessary. It's just my opinion. I mean, this is hotly debated, right? I mean, people that Lord of the Rings people and Hobbit people are, you know, they, these are passionate folks, right? I mean, every, oh, yeah. everyone has, everyone that cares about that has a very strong opinion. And I think Peter Jackson is brilliant. I guess what I would say is I did not enjoy the first Hobbit movie as much as any of the other three Lord of the Rings movies. I would completely agree with that too. So you'll have to uh, have to let me know what you think about about the second one. I'll I'll get it on Redbox or something. Yeah, and I will say that um, the best movie I've seen all year is Gravity. That was an intense movie. Yeah, uh, that's the that's the best movie I've seen all year, both from a special effects technology standpoint and just from a you know I thought the content of the movie was great. I thought the acting was just off the charts. I mean, I just I was I was totally sucked in by that movie. That was one of those movies where I sat down I in 5 minutes went by and then the movie was over. I mean, I was just like totally sucked into that movie and really enjoyed it. Yeah, well, our, my wife and I saw that one. We've seen a when she got out of school for the second time and started working full or well, basically full time. We we've kind of seen every movie that we wanted to see, and we go to those. Uh, it's not I pick. We have one called Flicks Brewhouse here in Round Rock, and uh, it's very very similar. But we've seen almost every single movie, and, and during that one, I mean, it's, we're just like on that literal edge of your seat, just just an adrenaline rush. And then after you're done, uh, it's like I need to I need to go take a nap. I was <laughs> exactly sick. right. We were we were worn out after that. But yeah, we love movies, so that's definitely one of the things I do to unwind. Awesome. That's a good yeah, good answer. We we do the do the same thing. Mark, what is one tip or piece of advice that you could give people who, like like me who are just starting their podcast uh, or just starting a blog or wanting to start a, a business? What 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 advice do you have for people like me? I'm going to give you two things. Okay. No extra charge for the second thing. So the first thing is Understand, understand well that by starting, you have put yourself in a very elite class of people. You've separated yourself from the people who dream about doing something amazing and never do anything. And now you're in the class of people who dream about doing something amazing and have taken bold action. You know, if you've done something, if you've started a blog, if you've started a podcast, if you've done something like that, you've put yourself out there, started your small business, you know, whatever it is, you have just separated yourself from every other Joe Schmo who said, I'd like to have my own business someday. And that's amazing. And you need to recognize that and celebrate that success because that's a big, big deal. Now, the other thing I'll say to you, and this is the you know the the flip side of it is failure, and particularly in something like podcasting, really is defined as giving up. 
it may take you whatever your goals are. Maybe your goal is to be the next, uh, you know, most famous podcaster in the world. Maybe your goal is to create a full time income from your business. Maybe your goal is just to have enough money to have a car payment, you know, whatever it is. Maybe your goals aren't monetary at all. Maybe your goals have to do with listeners or just maybe you're just doing it for fun. Whatever your goals are, though, have some and recognize that failure is really only achieved if you quit. In this kind of business, you can always modify your tactics. You can always try harder. You can always employ some new strategy, some new technology, make some new connection. And so as long as you don't quit, you haven't, you haven't failed. And, and one of the things that I see people do is they say, well, I, you know, I tried this and it didn't work out. I tried this thing or that thing or whatever, and I quote unquote failed. Well, failure meant that they stopped trying. And one of the things that you'll find about the, the really successful people that you admire, the ones that, you know, you hear about, uh, in, when you go to these big conferences or you're, you're in whatever your niche is in, they have many, many, many failures, many, many, many things that they tried and didn't quite work out. But instead of quitting, they changed tactics slightly. They, they, they changed the format of their podcast. They, they changed the, the, um, name of the show. They changed the way they were promoting it. They changed the header on their website, you know, whatever it is. Um, but they didn't quit. And so that's my advice to your listeners is if you're doing something, be amazed at yourself for making progress and now don't quit. That's, that's some really good advice, Mark. You know, we, we often forget, you know, like, uh, I think Babe Ruth, you know, missed the ball, swing and a miss. He whiffed it, what, like 60, 70% of the yeah. time? Yeah, at least, yeah. I mean, so when you, with these pro baseball, I'm not a big baseball person, but, you know, these uh, uh, one in three, a hit one time out of three pitches is like Hall of Fame, practically. And But when we apply it to our live, you know, it, well, this, this one thing didn't work, well, what if Michael Jordan had done that? He he missed ten shots in a row, but he made a slam dunk the eleventh and missed a couple and did it. And he's one of the ba- greatest players in in the history of basketball. So I, I I appreciate your advice because I've tried some things that didn't work or some things were more successful. And uh, it's definitely important to look at how far you've come, not how far or close you are to achieving your goal. So I am a big baseball fan. Michael Jordan, uh, <laughs> Michael Jordan fan as well. Michael Jordan, um, is often quoted with saying you, you miss all the shots that you don't take, but I'll tell you about Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth struck out over a thousand times in his career, something on the order of 1300. I cannot remember the exact number, but if you ask baseball fans, who is the, the top playoff player the clutch guy, the guy who you want on your team in October if you're trying to win a pennant. Almost everyone in baseball, if you gave them a top 10 list, most people would include Reggie Jackson on that list. Okay, Reggie Jackson's one of the greatest baseball players of all time, for sure. And he is, his nickname is Mr. October, right? Because he's the guy who shows up and hits the home runs in the playoffs. I mean, this guy is absolutely, truly amazing. Reggie Jackson struck out over 2,500 times in his career. He's the number one all-time strikeout leader in all of the history of Major League Baseball. Wow. And I'm looking at his Wikipedia page right now. His batting average uh, was... 262 which means what 74 percent of the time he missed yeah you know i i i wish everybody that's listening to this and i need to take it to heart myself is if if i fail 10 percent of the time i'm like well i'm gonna go do the next thing i, I can't imagine uh you know a 50 percent or 60 percent so I, I think you gave some really really valuable advice there mark so i i appreciate that are you a rangers fan I am a Rangers fan. I grew up in the National Leagues in Houston, so it took me about 10 years to get my mind wrapped <laughs> wrapped around American League baseball, which I still think is 
inappropriate, <laughs> but <laughs> I think everyone who plays should have to hit the ball. I just have a fundamental uh, feeling about that, but, um, you know, I'm a huge baseball fan. And so, yes, I'm a huge Rangers fan. I grew up with Nolan Ryan. You know, I mean, he was throwing the ball with the Astros when I was going to major league baseball games. I saw him pitch on numerous occasions Heck yeah, at his baseball card, the yellow one with a hundred all over it. Absolutely, yes, I know exactly. That's a great card, by the way. So, yeah. so yeah, I I uh, I love baseball and I love the Rangers and and baseball. You know, one of the reasons baseball is such a great sport in America is because it's the there are so many analogies between baseball and life, and strikeouts is certainly one of them. Well, Mark, if someone wanted to reach out to you and, and connect with you online or say thank you for being on the show, where would they? Go and do that. Where would you want to send them? Well, I tell you, um, this is one of the first places I've said this, so this is almost an exclusive. After after ten, heck yeah, it is. After, That's what we're about here. After <laughs> ten years of trying, begging, pleading, offering money, uh, cajoling, employing brokers, I finally secured MarkMason.com. Awesome. So, I'm going to go there right so now. So it's uh, just a shell of a site right now. It's not, I mean, I've got an uh, initial responsive design up there, but the, the content's not all there, but it's got all my social media contacts. What I would say is if your fans have um, questions about internet marketing or anything related to internet business, I try to answer each and every question that's posted on my Facebook fan page. And so they should feel free to ask questions there. And that's can, you can find me at facebook.com forward slash Mason World, M-A-S-O-N-W-O-R-L-D. And that links those links, of course, if you go to markmason.com, you can dig around and find all that stuff as well. Excellent, Mark. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. Uh, you have a wonderful, wonderful morning. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I hope you have an absolutely – fantastic day thank you again mark for taking time out of your day to hang out with me and be on the empowered podcast i think i'll actually get to see mark tonight with uh when when james kinson is speaking so i'm excited to reconnect with with old friends and uh, people who have listened to their podcast if you'd like to connect with me head over to twitter you can find me at empowered ellery or if you're on facebook you can go to facebook.com slash empowering the 80 percent so again that's at empowered ellery facebook.com slash empowering the 80 percent you can find all of those links and more at empowered podcast Dot com. And I do want to take one moment to thank our sponsor, What's Next Blogging, for helping out with this episode. You know, if you're a blogger like me and you've got a, your pages set up, you've got your posts set up, but there's that one thing that you don't know exactly how to do, whether it's, you know, maybe getting a favicon or getting social icons set up on your website. What's Next Blogging has tutorials for all of those things. And if you're also a podcaster like me and you're trying to figure out how to configure the Blueberry PowerPress plugin or something like that, those tutorials are also on whatsnextblogging.com. And if you go to whatsnextblogging.com slash free, you can get a customized free tutorial that walks you step by step through the process of doing almost anything when it pertains to your blog or your website or something like that. Again, that's whatsnextblogging.com slash free, and I encourage you uh, to get that. So really take charge of your, your content, get it displaying the way that you want to, and master the internet. Thank you again for tuning in to another episode of the Empowered Podcast. I'm your host, Ellery Wells. Here's a taste of what's coming up on our next episode. Have a great day. I would say 9 out of 10 people thought I was crazy, but that's typical. 9 out of 10 people always want to take the safe route. Obviously, within the franchise organization, other owners and things thought I was nuts. But if I had been, you know, waffling, the, the opinions of others would have been fairly destructive for me. 